So what's the next topic for STEM in 30? Oh, we're going to do our first show on helicopters. Helicopters? Oh, that is so cool. All of my favorite shows growing up had helicopters in them. There was the A-Team and Magnum P.I. and Airwolf and Chips. First of all, Chips was more about motorcycles than it was about helicopters, and this is not an action show. This, this is STEM 30. Hi, I'm Marty. And I'm Beth. Today we are coming to you live from the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center in Chantilly, Virginia. And this place is amazingly cool and super huge. Near us today we have a Huey and a Cobra helicopter, as well as the first X-35 ever produced. That's an airplane that can take off almost vertically. Now today's show is all about helicopters. We'll be talking about this green dual-rotored frog that you see behind us, as well as the orange and white Coast Guard helicopter hanging in the air. To begin, we'd like to welcome our in-house audience, the J. Michael Lunford Middle School. You guys worked really hard on your questions today, and we are looking forward to having one of our experts answer them. Speaking of experts, we have an expert standing by ready to answer those questions. Those watching at home, go ahead and submit those questions. Anything you ever wanted to know about helicopters is fair game. Go ahead and submit that. Our expert will answer them, and we might even use some of them on the show today. Now, for some reason, for the helicopter show, Marty thought it'd be a really great idea to take a ride in an actual helicopter. There were a couple of decisions that we needed to make about riding in the helicopter, and uh, Beth made the call on one of them, and I do think it was the right call. Yeah, I suggested that we ride with the doors off and not on. So do you want to take a look at our ride? <laughs> Let's check it out. activity in and around the airport. Read back all little short instructions. Advise on initial contact. You have information, Delta. That's a ground afternoon. It's helicopter 9233 Foxtrot. Information, Delta Squad Company code. Ready for departure. We're heading north. Guys, what do you think? You're flying. Oh, it's great. It's wow. just great. <laughs> this is this is pretty amazing. Uh, 
I was not expecting to go backwards to start, but wow. All right, let's go flying. Okay. Woo! That's the afternoon. It's helicopter 9233 Fox Air Photo. Hold them short of Bravo Gulf, ready for departure. We're heading north. I'm being piloted around by Steve Busman of Busman Aviation. Steve, thank you so much for giving us a ride today. My pleasure. You guys picked a good day for it. All right, so right now we're about 800 feet. Putting along at about 70 knots. It's about 80 miles an hour. Tell us about how far this can fly and the fuel that it uses. Sure. This is a, uh, a turbine-powered helicopter. We burn kerosene, so Jet A fuel. And we hold 64 gallons of fuel. And it's right below uh, Beth and uh, John in the back cabin there. So as we burn our fuel, it does not change our center of gravity, so we don't have to compensate for that. So on a, on a good day with uh, zero wind, we can get from here to New York. It's about 200 nautical miles on a full tank of gas. It's about two hours, about 100 knots. And you have to drive this with both your hands and your feet, is That's, that correct? Yep, at all times. Yep, there's no autopilot in this machine, so... Um, both ends, both feet are at working the entire time. So if I have to make a radio change, for example, where I need to uh, use my right hand to do that, I have to put friction on the collective so I can take my left hand, move my left hand to the psychic, now I'm flying with my left hand, use my right hand to make the adjustment, move my right hand back, come back to the collective, remove the friction. That's why the military um, in these machines will put the command seat in the left. Because that way you're just taking your left hand to make the radio change, your right hand always stays on the cycling. So Beth, what do you think of your first helicopter ride? Well... <laughs> I'm, seeing, I'm hearing a little hesitation. I'm having fun. There you go. Sometimes you have to do things that scare you. And this is way out of my comfort zone, but it's incredibly cool. <laughs> the view from up here is just stunning. There was a rather large debate about whether we should have doors or not. I have to say, probably no doors was the right call. Scary, but the right call. <laughs> We're joined today by Roger Connor, a curator here at the National Air and Space Museum. And Roger is also a licensed airplane pilot and really close to being a licensed helicopter pilot. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you, Marty. Now, we've got some incredible helicopters on display here. And the one that jumps to mind first is this giant one behind us called the Frog. Can you tell us about the Frog? Yeah, the Frog, uh, or in military language, it's a CH-46 Sea Knight. And it, uh, it flew about 50 years um, in military service. So the, this is what we call a tandem rotor helicopter. So it's got a big rotor in the front and a big one in the back. Uh, and it's used to carry cargo, supplies, troops. And this one was used in several different conflicts, correct? Oh yeah, from uh, the Vietnam War onwards. Uh, used a lot in Iraq and Afghanistan in recent years. Awesome, now we also have the newest one that's on display, this Coast Guard helicopter that's hanging up. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, Marty, our new uh, HH-52 Sea Guard helicopter was one that was used by the Coast Guard for a number of years, also from the 1960s into the 1980s. And that was, uh, that was used to save people uh, usually in the water. It was amphibious, so it was designed to uh, be part boat, part helicopter. Now, it's got a really interesting history behind it as well. Oh, yeah, it saved a lot of people over its years in service. Uh, probably the most significant uh, event was in uh, 1979 in the Gulf of Mexico. There was a huge collision between a oil tanker and a freighter, giant fireball, uh, a lot of people trapped on the sh burning ships, and uh, this helicopter was used to pull those guys out, and without the helicopter, they would have been goners. Wow, wow. Well, we've learned a little bit about a couple of the helicopters in our collection, but now we want to learn about how they actually get off the ground. So let's go over to Beth and see if she can give us a lift. Okay, so I'm here with a couple of friends from our middle school that's visiting, and we're going to talk a little bit about how helicopters and airplanes get off the ground. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about air. So I've got you as my volunteer. What you're going to do is you're going to back up, take this with you, and hold it like that. Well, you, no. you're going to put three, okay, you're going to put three big breaths in there, and let's see how far you blow it up. Two, three. All right, that's not bad, all right? Okay, shall I try? Sure. How many do you think I'll do? Four. Four, let's back it up, keep backing up. Keep going until I tell you, back it up. All right, there we go. Okay, we ready? All right, how did I do? I, okay, I did a little bit better than you did, didn't I? Okay, well, here's the thing. 
This is kind of a party trick. This uh, scientist named Bernoulli, he lived a long time ago, came up with something called Bernoulli's Principle. And what that says is that faster moving air creates a lower pressure. So what I did, you were just taking all the air out of your lungs and just trying to fill that bag. But what I did was I blew into it, made the air move a little faster, right? That created a lower pressure. But what about the pressure outside the bag? Is it higher or is it low? What do you think? It's low in the bag, so what do you think it is outside? Okay, so it was high pressure outside. And air tries to like be all at one sort of pressure. So the, the high pressure rushed in there and that's how I filled the bag. Now, what does this have to do with flying? I know that's what you're asking, right? Okay, so let's take a look at this. This is an airfoil, all right? This, what we have done is we have just cut up an airplane wing, okay? So like a slice of, like a loaf of bread. And if it were flying, this would be the leading edge. So air hits this front edge. Can air go through this? No, no. So it's got to split. Some of it's got to go over the top. Some of it's got to go under the bottom. Now the air on the top, that starts moving faster. So it creates what kind of pressure? Faster moving air is low pressure. Up underneath is high pressure. And that's what creates the lift. And that's what gets an airplane into the air. Now I know this is hard to understand if I'm just talking to you about it. So you guys all pick up your pieces of paper. I want you to hold them like this. Pinch them. We're going to put it on our top lip and we're going to blow, but before we blow, which way is it going to go? Up or down? Up. Let's try. One, two, three. All right. So again, you've got, just like when you fill the bag, you're just taking the air out of your lungs and pushing this up. Now we're going to put it on our bottom lip and we're going to blow, but before we blow, which way is it going to go? Up or down? Down, let's try. One, two, three. Which way is it going? It's going up because you've got faster moving air on top, creates a lower pressure. These two try and even out. That creates lift and that's what lifts the piece of paper into the air. Now when you go home tonight, if someone asks you what you learned, you say, okay, could I have a $20 bill and I'll show you all about Bernoulli's principle? Do this. Put the money in your pocket and you will have gotten paid for what you learned today. All right, just don't tell anybody. All right, so how do helicopters work? Do helicopters have wings like airplanes? They use propellers. They use, they have a propeller, but the, the rotor on top, the blades on the top of the helicopter actually have a, a, a significant shape. Let's take a look at that shape. What does that look like? It kind of looks like this shape. Yeah, yeah. so airfoils, are also on helicopter blades. Those start spinning and that creates lift and that's how the helicopter gets off the ground. Now, there's an issue with helicopters though. Once that top blade starts spinning, there's something called torque and I'm gonna let Marty and Roger talk a little bit about that. Thanks Beth. So one of the forces acting on a helicopter is called torque. And there's a pretty interesting way that, they, that you've solved for torque on a helicopter. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, Marty. So torque is the equal and opposite reaction to the spinning force of the engine turning that rotor. And it, it's a lot of force. Uh, you could actually have a helicopter that doesn't have this long tail boom on it and just have to have a really powerful engine to fight that torque. But what we do with the helicopter, we have the long tail boom, which is a lever. So if you're familiar with what a lever does, we're going to use a smaller force, but over a longer distance. And so what we have at the end of the tail rotor is a small propeller that's going to push air, and that's going to be that force that gets applied by the lever. And so if you didn't have that, it would just do this and spin. It would spin around and around. And sometimes that, that, that has happened in helicopters, that something happens to your tail rotor, and all of a sudden you start winding up really fast. That doesn't sound like any fun no. at all. No. <laughs> all right, well, are you ready to take some questions? Sure, let's right, do it. Let's start with a video question. Hi, I'm Alexa, and how are helicopters different than airplanes? So airplanes and helicopters are actually more alike than you might think. Both are using wings. In a helicopter, the wings are just a lot longer and narrower. Uh, the big difference is how those wings are pushed through the air. So with an airplane, you're using a propeller or jet engines to push it through the air to move the air over the top of it and get that lift effect that Beth was talking about. With a helicopter, what we're doing is using the engine to turn the wing, and that allows us the advantage of taking off vertically. Awesome. All right, let's do go to an online question. What does the word helicopter mean? 
Well, it's from two Greek words. So helix and pteron, so that's spiral and wing. So spiral wing. And it goes back about uh, 150 years. It was, uh, the term was invented in France. Wow. All right. Let's go to an audience question. Who's got our first question? Come on up. About how fast do the helicopter blades go? So the helicopter blades, um, th one thing to be aware of is, is they're turning in a circle. So the parts that are nearest the mass, they're going to be turning a lot slower than the parts that are out towards the tip. So near the tip, uh, the speeds can be close to the speed of sound. If you get up to the speed of sound, uh, bad things start to happen. There's some a lot of forces uh, start to pile up on the blade. So you don't want to do that. So short answer at the tip, near the speed of sound, a lot slower as you get near the mast. All right. Let's go to an online question next. How high is a helicopter able to fly? So about the highest anybody has ever landed a helicopter was on Mount Everest, at the top of Mount Everest. And that was done fairly recently. So that was really kind of pushing things. Now you can get, you can actually get uh, above that if you're flying forward. So if you're not trying to hover, uh, you can actually go a little bit higher. So they've done uh, almost 45,000 feet uh, in a helicopter. So pretty high. Wow. A little bit higher than 800 feet that, that we were flying at earlier. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, Roger, like we talked about earlier, you're real close to having your helicopter pilot's license. So we thought today we would give you a flight test. All right. So we're gonna have three questions today. What we're gonna do is we're gonna show you a split screen of the cockpit controls and then what's happening on the outside of the helicopter. And we'll, what we want you to do is explain to us how that affects the movements of the helicopter. Sure. So you ready? All right. All right, let's go to the first question on tail rotor pedals. All right, so a tail rotor, uh, as we were talking about, that's our anti-torque device. And what we do with the tail rotor when we push on the pedals is we change the pitch of those blades and that makes our left-right movement, what we call yaw. Okay, so we're actually talking about kind of basically spinning and, and only in a controlled way. Right. Oh, outstanding. Well, it looks like you got that one right. Let's go on to our next question, which is the collective. Now, with the collective, what we're doing is we're going to change the pitch of the blades all together, all at once. And we, that's what collective means. We're doing it all together. And if we increase the pitch of the blades, what we're doing is having, having them uh, essentially create more lift. Um, getting more bite in the air, and that's causing us to rise. Less pitch, less lift, it's going to be sound. Outstanding. You see here on the screen that you are exactly right on that one. Really nice job. It's like you've done this before. And let's, uh, let's head over to our next question, which is the cyclic stick, which is in the cockpit. Tell us about that. So the cyclic is the control that the, uh, is, it's the stick, it's what the pilot's using to change the direction of the aircraft, its movement. So for, to fly forward, to fly back, to fly side to side, that's uh, what's being done with the cyclic. Now, it's the kind of magic that's, that's really happening in that uh, rotor hub. So it's the trickiest part. What we're doing is we're changing each blade individually, not all at once, but each blade's pitch as it moves around the rotor hub. So at one point it's gonna be higher, then it's gonna move lower, and that's going to cause the blades to rise or descend, and that creates a change of the uh, path of those uh, blades. And that's going to create a change in the directional force of the helicopter. It's going to angle it left or right, forward, back. I was amazed when we flew how, how much Steve was on that stick because it was constant. There was no break in it. Helicopters uh, have controls that are more interconnected than an airplane. Airplane, you can kind of sit back and do one thing at a time. A helicopter, any movement in the cyclic or collective or, or uh, the torque pedals, it's going to affect the other ones and you have to compensate. So both hands, uh, both feet are always moving. Wow. Now on our flight, we had something really interesting and a little bit scary kind of happen towards the end of the flight. Um, and Beth's going to tell us more about that. Okay, yes, yeah, something did happen. And what we're going to do is I'm going to play you a little clip of our flight and I want you guys to listen really carefully to the sound that the helicopter's making. Okay, what did, did you guys hear anything different? What did you hear, anything? Um, like this weird like sort of like, um, like thumping sound. Thumping sound, what did you hear? I heard a lot of movement. It was different than um, the smooth kind of flying. Like the smooth, yeah. Okay, what did you hear? It was like, like loud. 
it was very loud. What did you hear? It sounded like a lot of like wind. Of like a lot of wind? Okay, let's listen to it again, and I'm going to tell you the, the point you really need to listen for. So let's listen to it again. Did you, did you guys hear how it sort of went quiet at that, that area? Okay, so what happened was we were in the helicopter, and we asked the pilot to disengage the rotors, all right? So the rotors are the things that's spinning that creates a lift that keeps us up. All right, so he disengaged. So what do you think happened? Do you think we just crashed? Like glided? Like glided, what do you think? Yeah, I think you like glided. Glided? What about you guys? Sort of like hovering. Sort of like hovering? What yeah, about I think you? you guys glided. Okay, well, let's take a look at what happened. Okay, so at that point we didn't quite land, but uh, the, the blades continued to spin. That's called auto-rotation, and you're right. We sort of glided down or auto-rotated, and what happened was as we got to the runway, the pilot, thankfully, turned the, uh, engaged the rotors again, and so we were able to take off. Now, you guys have sort of tiny little helicopters, so we're going to auto-rotate them. So everybody hold them up, All right, and on the count of three, we're going to drop them now. Are they going to fall straight down or are they going to just sort of spin? Okay, ready? One, two, three. Let's see what happens. Great job, you guys. You all landed safely. No one got hurt. Marty, Roger, back to you. All right, thanks, Beth. Now, I have to tell you one kind of little hidden secret about that video. Yeah, Beth and I weren't in the helicopter when that happened. We took some of our brave crew and let them do the auto rotation for us and videotape it. We thought they'd get better video and Neither one of us really wanted to be in there when that was happening. But as a pilot, you say that's actually quite a bit of fun. Oh, yeah. It's a blast. <laughs> <laughs> now, Roger, one of the things that's happening with helicopters, they're, they're really progressing, and, and there's a new kind of age of helicopters with drones. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So a lot of you have probably seen the quadcopters or hexacopters, octocopters, depending upon the number of rotors that are out there. Uh, they're a lot simpler than the helicopter in terms of the way that they're controlled. It's all software. What they're doing is controlling the speed uh, of electric motors, and that's just driving a fixed pitch propeller. So there's no cyclic or collective control on those. Um, so if you scale this up and put a person in it, and some people are starting to do this now, uh, it gets kind of tricky. You'd get pretty sick riding one of those because all any little movement to control the thing, you're going to feel pretty strongly in it. Helicopter. It's nice and stable in the cabin, and the rotor's doing all the moving part. Uh, in a drone, the whole thing's pitching around. And drones don't auto-rotate, do they? No. If, if you lose the power in the drone, the whole thing comes down. That doesn't sound like any fun to be in at all. No, you need a parachute if you're going to make it safe. Now, the Smithsonian actually recently collected the first FAA-approved delivery drone, right? That's right. Last year, it made uh, a delivery of medicine down in southwest Virginia. And that seems like a really interesting new field that we might be seeing bringing stuff to our doorstep. Oh yeah, it's very exciting. <laughs> now tell me about the Osprey because that's kind of a combination of a helicopter and an airplane. Yeah, so the advantage of an Osprey is it can take off vertically but fly with airplane type speeds. The disadvantage is you have to carry those extra parts with you. So you're part airplane, part helicopter. It's not doing either one of those things as, as good as a pure airplane in forward flight or as a helicopter in hovering. Now, there's also a new design coming out that has two rotors stacked. Tell me about right. that. One reason that you might do that, uh, to have two rotors on top of each other called coaxial, uh, is you either need it, uh, a narrower helicopter. So if, let's say you're on a ship, you don't have uh, enough room for that full uh, rotor span. Uh, you might do that. Or if you're trying to go faster, one thing that you can do is if you stack those rotors on top of each other, they're going to reach their speed limit. Uh, which is called retreating blade stall, they'll reach it opposite each other, so they counteract that effect. And so you can kind of push into that regime of flight, which a single rotor helicopter cannot do. But the dual rotor helicopter with them stacked are like the frog behind us. 
uh, they don't have to deal with the, the spin of torque. Yeah, so they don't have the torque problem. Awesome. Were you ready to give some questions a whirl? Sure. Let's All right, let's start with an online question. Would a helicopter be able to land on Mars? So this is actually uh, uh, not as uh, crazy a question as you might think. And in fact, at this moment, engineers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory are developing a helicopter to fly on Mars. As part of their Mars sampling rover, which they're planning on sending out in a few years, they're looking at for different ways to go out and get samples. So one problem with the, the, the Mars rovers that they've had is they get bogged down in the, the really loose uh, soil on, on Mars. And so if you could fly around and get samples, it'd be a lot easier. Now, flying on Mars is not a simple thing. The air is very, very thin there. So you're gonna need a lot bigger rotors uh, to make that work, or maybe more power. So it's a, it's a really big engineering challenge, but essentially what they're doing is making a very fancy drone to fly on Mars. That's awesome. All right, we've got an audience question next. Come on up. How does a helicopter stay balanced when there's uneven weight on each side? Okay, this is a very good question. So how does a helicopter fly if it's unbalanced? And this, this is a very tricky part with helicopters. Helicopters are usually a little bit more difficult to handle with weight that's not kind of perfectly balanced. Airplanes, they're a lot easier to trim out if the load's shifting around a bit. Helicopters, it's pretty narrow. So when you look at how a helicopter's built, there's a lot of thought going into where you put the engines, where you put the gas tank, because you really have to have most of your, your weight has to be right under the center of the rotor. So you have to design the helicopter so that anything that's gonna change in weight, so that's the gas or that's the people you pick up or cargo that you load on, that should really be kind of balanced, centered on that rotor system. If you have the frog, it's a lot easier. You know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, a board that's being held up at both ends rather than a seesaw. It's going to be a lot more stable. So that's, that's the best way to deal with uh, cargo that's a little bit out of whack. Single rotor helicopter, you just got to design it really carefully. Awesome. Well, Roger, thank you so much for talking with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Marty. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Saffron, and remind everybody that in two weeks, we will have a show that is going to rock. Hi, I'm Marty Kelsey, one of the hosts of STEM in 30, and check this out! In this case are rocks from the surface of the moon. The moon. These rocks were picked up by the astronauts on Apollos 15, 16, and 17, and brought back here to Earth. Astronauts are walking around and they look down and they're like, hey, there's a cool rock. They picked it up, they brought it back to Earth, and now they're right here in my hands. If you think this is cool, be sure to tune in to STEM in 30. If you've ever wanted to know what it's like to fly in a helicopter, we have posted on our website a 360 degree video of our first flight, so you can actually look around just like we were doing. We hope to see you guys again in two weeks. Thanks for watching.